Kia ora, welcome to Parliament TV. Over the next hour, we present items from the TVNZ collection, from archives held by Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, to remember the politics from our past. Former Labour Prime Minister David Longy died on the 13th of August 2005 at the age of 63. A week after his funeral, a public celebration of his life was held in Auckland. Gary McCormick was the master of ceremonies. Here are some of the highlights. Welcome to Ericsson Stadium, the big top, and welcome to a celebration. Today it's the celebration of the life of David Longy. His family gave their private farewells on Wednesday. Today is a time for all his friends, the public, everyone who knew and loved David Longy, to pay their respects. We'll be bringing you one hour of uninterrupted coverage. There'll be music, there'll be speeches, there's representations from all the communities who want to be here to pay their final respects to this great New Zealander. So we'll We'll take you now direct and live to one hour of celebration of the life of David Longy. Hengamangakoreroingatuponamatuakotokofakamenamaikirungakitafuatangakitereokarangwatara no <laughs> Fakatungi ai te nei rā he rangi, whakamaharatanga ki aia. Nō reira ko tāku, ko ta whakatau i a tātau i runga i ngā whatango te nei rangi. Me te whakamihi anō ki a tātau i ngā mana, i ngā reo, i ngā mātāwaka, putanao i te ao, haramai, 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 haramai. Haramai i ngā rangatira. Te nei tātau i hui hui nei raro i te tui nui o te nei o ngā hare. E whakatutuki nei ngā kōrero. A te tūpana nō i apotatau i tāne me ana. Ko tahi te kohao te ngira i kūhuna i te miro mā, te miro whero, me te miro pango. E muri au kia mau ki te tūmana ko te whakapono me te ture. Te mea nui rawa ko te aroha te nei e hui nei tātau. I roro raro i te korowai o te aroha. Me ta mahra anō ki tō tātou rangatira Premier Minita ya David Longi tēnā kōtou, tēnā kōtou, tēnā tātou. Tēnā koe i te Minita Helen Clark ko whakaeke nei ki runga ki te reo karanga o tēnei o ngā rangatira kōhuri ki te pō. Nō reira e te pau i hi rangatira rāwiri haere a haukua mōhia nei te mōtu ko ngā roto tīnana ki te rua ko iwi o ngā tūpana mātua. Ko e tēnei mātau ngā kanuhi, e pupuru nei ngā taonga. O tēnei mea te aroha i haire mai ki te whakanui, me te kōrero rero i te wahanga ki a koe. Mō i mai roto i te tini, mō i mai roto i te mano, o tira mō i mai roto te ariki. Kia hoki i mai, Ki tō whānau e noho nei, ta whānau pani, mākareti ki tō whānau. Koutou, 
Eta whanau whanui, huri noi to tātou papa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou o tira, ke ora tātou katoa. I am a Anoreira Manaki mai a mātou i roti tēnei rangi, ko hui nei, te tita rahi, te mana, te wehi, ki runga i te reo karango te rā. Tia kena mai a mātou i roti tēnei rangi e pā, ko koe e mōhiwana ki ngā ara ngā huarahi. Tēne ki wā, ko tai mai, ki runga i te reo karango tō mātou rangatira i a David Longi. Tēnei rā mātou i tukunei a mātou ko moe me tiki kia koe, ke manaki mai a mātou i roto i te kaupapa. Ko koe tonu kei mua, kei muri a mātou i ngā wā katoa, rōria ki tu i ngā tapu. Amen. Amen. Ero tata. Thank you, Eru. Thank you to the people of Tainui. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, we are delighted to have you all with us today. It has been a very difficult, emotional and trying week for some people. It has been a spectacularly emotional week for family and friends and those who knew David well. You all knew David well, and that's the reason why you're here, and we are delighted to have you with us to celebrate David's life. At the service earlier in the week, it was very difficult to look at the coffin in the church and realize that our great friend, that great man, was lying there. It was beyond belief. And we are aware that right throughout New Zealand at the moment, there are people dealing with that very same feeling, that this great one has gone from amongst us. But today, we're going to celebrate David's life in a manner that he would have enjoyed. His friends are here. We have some very talented performers who are going to sing in David's honor and perform in David's honor. And there are speeches to be made to celebrate his life and times. I have a message here from the Governor-General of New Zealand, which I'd now like to read. Greetings to all who have come together in memory of one of our great New Zealanders, David Longy. David was an extraordinary man who dedicated his life to making New Zealand a better place for all of us. His devoted service for our country was honoured two years ago when he was made a member of the Order of New Zealand. This is the highest honour that our country can give. Indeed, no more than 20 New Zealanders can be members of the order at any time. When David received the honor at Government House in Wellington, he rated his contribution, and I quote here, as a mere fly speck on the wall of history. I disagree. On the wall of our country's history, David was an extremely gifted artist painting one of our greatest murals. We owe a lot to David Longy, who has given so much to his fellow New Zealanders. David, we thank you. Signed, Governor-General Dame Sylvia Cartwright. 
Could I now call upon the Right Honourable Helen Clark, Prime Minister of New Zealand, to deliver her tribute. I'd like to acknowledge the many members of David's family who are here today on stage, Margaret, Peter, Annette and Roy and extended family, colleagues, Sir Ed and Lady Hillary, Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa, Misa Telefoni, many other distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Over the past week, letters of tribute to David Longy have poured into my office from around the world. Leaders in the Pacific especially regarded David as a true friend who understood their aspirations. There were others with whom he had crossed swords, who respected his passion and his great powers of advocacy. David was, quite simply, an extraordinary New Zealander. He put our country on the map and he gave us great pride in being New Zealanders. His vision saw our small country stand up for big ideas and for values critical to the survival of humankind. Yet much as he rubbed shoulders with the world's elites and our own, my sense is that David was always happiest back home in Mangari, close to Otahuhu, where he grew up. He identified with Monaco City and with the multicultural society it became with the waves of Māori migration from rural New Zealand which began after the war and the peoples of the Pacific coming from the 50s and 60s on. David maintained friendships across many communities. His great love of India is well known and he was held in great respect there as he was among the Indian community here in Auckland which only a few weeks ago awarded him life membership of its organisation for his friendship. David came to politics from the law, where he had established his reputation as a powerful advocate for marginalised people. His plea in mitigation, based on quick mastery of a brief, was legendary, and his ability to master complex detail and develop and articulate a case on his feet stood him in good stead in politics as well. His wit was legendary, and he took as much delight in applying it to himself as to anybody else. We all have our favourite stories, like David as a big man getting into a lift by himself when once in Japan, and claiming that an automated voice demanded, would one of you please get out? <laughs> Even in these last few especially difficult weeks, with failing health, that ability to laugh and see the ironic side of even the most desperate situation never appeared to leave him. Indeed, his courage during what was clearly great suffering was truly inspirational. For so many reasons today, our service must be a celebration of David's life. Because he himself touched the lives of so many people, as a lawyer, as a local member of parliament, as prime minister, and as one concerned about his fellow human beings. David hated injustice, and he would go to considerable lengths to see that ordinary people up against the system got a fair go. David spent five of his 63 years as prime minister and close to one third of his life as a member of parliament. It is on these years that the public record and the commentary focuses. And they were often difficult years, but the many high points were there alongside the lows. Today, we celebrate the highs, the pride, the elation of David at the peak of his powers, winning in 1984, taking the country with him to the Oxford Union. And we celebrate the big man with the big voice, the big heart, and the common touch. Few have the opportunity to lead their country, and even fewer are memorable. David Longy will go down in history as a truly memorable Prime Minister of New Zealand. 
He was an outstanding New Zealander who was proud of his country and proud to serve it. I want to say to David's family that many New Zealanders share your pride in him and know that our country is the better for David's contribution. We share your sorrow at this sad time. We share a deep sense of regret that David's years among us were just too short. We know we will not see his like again. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Prime Minister. And as our first singer prepares to come on stage, there is a story told to me at the funeral on Wednesday morning about David's memory. He could always remember people, and many of you can testify to that. He could remember your friends, how long ago he met you, where exactly it was. And about six months ago in the Vietnam cafe, or it may have been eight months ago, a man approached David and said, you won't remember me. And David looked at him for a moment and said, yes, I do. I nearly ran over you in Mangere in 1969. Our next speaker is another very, very distinguished New Zealander. You all know him, you all recognise him, and we're enormously grateful that he could be with us today to share in this celebration. I'd love to introduce now Sir Edmund Hillary. Twenty years ago, we held an election in New Zealand. I wasn't actually all that interested in the political topics, except for a strong support of New Zealand remaining nuclear free. <clears throat> Several days after that election, I had a telephone call and a firm voice asking for me. This is David Longy, he said. Astonished, I said, David who? <laughs> David replied, in a very peppery voice. Somewhat overcome, I answered the new Prime Minister. What can I do for you? I want you to be the new High Commissioner for New Zealand in India, he said. Well, I had no experience of diplomatic matters but a rather wide knowledge of India. It was a very appealing request. Come to my home tomorrow, he said. Still somewhat overwhelmed, I visited his modest home next day. What do you want me to do in India? I asked, do whatever you think is best, he replied. And so I became a High Commissioner. <laughs> I have never forgotten those powerful words, do whatever you think is best. And they guided me for the next five years that we spent in India. We will sadly miss this great man. Thank you.
Thank you, Sir Edmund. Well, what did David Longy mean to the Pacific community? It probably meant a lot to many people for different reasons. Um, I, I think, though, the, the first thing that comes to mind for many would be his op opposition to the dawn raids um, activities of the 1970s, 80s. Um, but he's also considered a hero for that, um, as well as considered a hero by ordinary people because he stood up for the underdogs, um, supported many who were single parents, beneficiaries, and challenged decisions made by government departments. And he was a master orator. He was, uh, and he made us all laugh. He made people believe that uh, big people and huge people um, are both intelligent and handsome. <laughs> and with me now is Bernard Brown. You go back in terms of the law with David Longy. Indeed, He yes. made his mark there too? Yes, um, David made um, two, I think, very influential uh, contributions to the law. Uh, one, of course, uh, with his oratorial, oratorial skills as, uh, as a um, uh, courtroom lawyer and uh, also uh, when he became um, Prime Minister and Attorney General with uh, an enormous amount of legislation. But Bernard Brown, his, his move from the law to politics, that was something that his skills in the law prepared him for? Indeed, it did. Um, I think he probably, by 1977, had had probably just about enough of uh, courtroom lawyering. He was a little bit disillusioned about uh, the uh, court's system, particularly at the uh, level at which he was practising, and uh, he was definitely looking for a change. It's fitting we're here at Ericsson and also talking to Gerald Ryan because David Longy's contact with Rugby League was a passionate one, wasn't it, Gerald? A passionate and more than that, also from an administrative viewpoint. He was there during the Super League Wars and played a very big part in the settlement we finally reached with him. It wasn't an easy time and when he came to the league, I think he came from the frying pan into the fire a bit because the league at the time was insolvent and uh, we won't go into that at the moment. But one day, I can tell you this now, when the f real story of the Super League Wars is told, and it will be, He'll go down as one of our great administrators, the Stacey Jones of our administrators. I'm sure of that. Thanks very much, Gerald. Missed by League and so many other communities. Yes, I'd go along with him. And of course, no celebration for David Longy without food and the Mad Butcher doing it for this special day. Made a very special day and, uh, you know, a very special New Zealander. And uh, I think it's be fitter in here to have it at a league ground because he was a good league man. He was patron of Mangry East, the Mighty Hawks. He was uh, also on the uh, board of the New Zealand Rugby League. So, yeah, good to have it here at the super top where the league is going to front up tonight for Stacey Jones as well, I might add. I'm now going to call upon a member of the family to speak. The first speaker from the family. Obviously this has been a very difficult week for them. It's been a difficult few months leading up to this week. But we're delighted to have with us first today Margaret Longy, David's sister. And I can say as I introduce Margaret that this very morning I had a call from a former pupil of Margaret's in Northland wishing to be remembered to you. <laughs> you have a lot of friends, young and old, Margaret. So ladies and gentlemen, would you put your hands together please and welcome Margaret Longy. quite nice to think that I've got one pupil that remembers me with affection. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the family because I am in fact now the oldest member of this family, despite what it says in David's book. It said Peter was born before 20, uh, 20 minutes before I was, and that is not true. <laughs> so I'm here as the matriarch, and Peter wishes to be known as the vice matriarch. Um, I decided today that I would Talk, uh, in talking about the private side of David's life, I would talk about the family that he was part of, rather than about him, David himself, and that may give you some insight into what sort of person he was as well. So just bear with me while I reminisce, really. And in looking for the right words to describe our family, one word kept coming back to me, and it was a word that Helen used. That word was big. We are big in numbers. We have a large extended family of nieces and nephews and of many first cousins and their partners and children all around the world and we keep in touch with every one of them. And at this point I'd like to pay special tribute to cousins Colin, Christopher and Judith, whose devotion to David was extraordinary, particularly over the last month. Thank you. There's also many second cousins all over the place as well. 
and we don't mention third cousins. Um, we're also big in size, and that was because of mum. Mum's cure for everything was food. When you were happy, there was food. When you were sad, there was food. And a lot of the time, that food was brain fritters, which she refused, but she refused to tell us what they were made of. And for 17 years, I thought they were called just eat them and be thankful the children in Hong Kong are starving. <laughs> or it could very well have been India or Africa, depending on which mission she was supporting at the time. And I particularly remember the Friday nights at Odahu. Every Friday night for years, we had an open home. The extended family would gather for conversation, debate and laughter, and mum would just empty out the fridge. So there'd be an eclectic, mismatched array of food covering every inch of the table. Uh, it embarrassed me something awful then, but I find myself doing it now. And it's great, I love it. And the smorgasbords of today just pale into insignificance for what mum had on the table. It's a big-hearted family. This is a family that has open arms, open homes, open fridges and open wallets. In our childhood, it was nothing to wake, in our childhood, it was nothing to wake up on a Sunday morning to find a bunch of Solomon Islanders sitting on the front lawn or a couple of large Fijians sitting at the breakfast table. And they often were wearing, were wearing Pop's clothes. He hadn't given them to him, Mum had. I never knew whether this was really where these people wanted to be. But if Mum had told them to be there, then they were very wise to have obeyed. We had big parents. Pop catered gently to our emotional needs, while Mum catered assertively to our spiritual and physical needs. And I'm not entirely convinced that she was successful on either count. Mum was determined that we would never get above our station. And there was one wonderful example of this when David was Prime Minister. We were all gathered at Cornwall Park one Sunday for a picnic to celebrate someone's birthday. There's a small group of teenagers near us with a ghetto blaster playing at full volume. After a while, the noise got too much for David, and he went over and asked them quite nicely if they'd mind turning the sound down. The young people did this relatively happily. You could see flickers of recognition on their faces as they tried to place where they'd seen him before. <laughs> Perhaps he was a, a retired famous rugby league player or something, I could see them thinking. <laughs> anyway, though they turned it down, but mum saw this interaction and she went marching over to them and she said, you turn that back up as loud as you like. He had no right to tell you to do that. He just thinks he's the boss of everything. <laughs> <laughs> These poor guys didn't know what to do then. <laughs> should they obey this retired rugby league player or should they obey this very bossy woman? So they turned it sort of half volume and then slunk off eventually. Uh, it's a family that's big in humour. It finds humour in everything, is irreverent about everything and has a fine sense of the ridiculous. And David delighted in bucking against authority. I remember him getting a lot of pleasure out of the time when the Odahu Traffic Authority decided to trial a one-way system through Odahu without going through the correct legal channels. David discovered they'd done this illegally, so he spent every spare moment he had after that driving up and down the streets the wrong way, <laughs> and they couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> it was wonderful. Ernie Seath, I remember him pleading with David, please, Mr Longy, please don't do this. David just took no notice. Even near the end of David's life, just after he had had his leg amputated, he got a lot of enjoyment out of the socks I gave him for his birthday. I've never given anyone socks for their birthday before. And out of Peter's observation that David looked about a foot, a foot shorter than he had done previously. <laughs> and I have to say, we did enjoy Mark Goshi's uh, telegram to David on his birthday, which I read to David which said, Carol and I think it's time you hopped out of bed now. <laughs> it's very good. Um, the family was big in the church. Odahu's social life in those days revolved around either the church or the pub. And as Grandma Longy was a primitive Methodist from Thames, there was no choice. We spent a large part of Sunday at Sunday school, Bible class and church. And the boys were involved in Boys Brigade. They did exciting physical activities, building canoes and canoeing down the Whanganui River trampolining and building a trampoline, going camping, lovely things like that. The girls went to Girls' Brigade. 
and we learned how to write thank you letters and to do flower arranging. <laughs> <laughs> Which has served me well to this day. <laughs> we all sang in the choir at church, um, and it was nothing like these wonderful people. They are just superb, weren't they? I just, I just kept thinking. <laughs> I was thinking, I was comparing them to the Odeo Methodist Church Choir, and you just can't compare it. Um, and I have to say, at David's funeral, it was a great joy to sing some of the old Methodist hymns and remember those days. It was big on music, the family. We all played the piano. Peter and I played the violin badly. David played clarinet and pipe organ, and Peter, also, uh, Peter played the trumpet, and Annette played the cello. We all played in the school orchestra. Pop sang in the church choir, although he never mastered any of the words. He used to just sing this sort of pom, 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 very enthusiastically. And mum decided to learn the piano when she was about 50 so she could play her favorite hymns. She never, she never mastered the left hand. And I can still hear her playing, what a friend we have in Jesus, with only one chord in the left hand all the way through. It's become a bit of a party piece for me to do now, and it's really difficult, I can tell you. <laughs> On Sundays, we were not allowed to play anything other than hymns, so we all used to get around the piano and playing our various instruments, worked our way through the hymn book. It was very good for honing our transposing and sight reading skills, and I can just see the kids of today doing that. <laughs> it's a joy and a privilege to be part of a family that has the wonderful capacity to share its wisdom and life experiences to rejoice in each other's successes and accomplishments without envy, and to empathize unconditionally in each other's disappointments and failures. David's generous spirit was pivotal to all this. He's left a huge gap, and we already miss him dreadfully. He was ours, and we loved him. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> we can see that the longing humour wasn't limited to David. I was already aware of that, but it's marvellous. Thank you so much. I'm going to call two chaps out on stage now who are loosely described as contemporary musicians. They are my age, but <laughs> I like to think of that as contemporary. Midge Marsden and Hammond Gamble will make their way out now and plug in their gear. Come on out, lads. I'll explain. Here they are, two New Zealand icons of music. <laughs> the last speech that David and I did together was at a winery uh, in Walkworth, Ascension Winery, and uh, uh, some contemporaries of ours, uh, Graham Brazier, Dave McCartney were there, and David Longy got into a very, very excited discussion about rugby league with these two rock and roll musicians. He'd also met Hammy here. Uh, he'd have spoken of you, Midge, so it's wonderful we have the two of them here today. They are both blues musicians, and there are very few happy blues songs, you may have noticed that. So, so if you're not emotional now, you may well be when this song is over. <laughs> Hammond and Mitch. Thank you very much. We'd like, to, uh, we'd like to do a little blues song for David, one we've done before. <laughs> this one's called The Key to the Highway. I got the key to the highway Filled out, I'm bound to go I'm gonna leave here running Walking's gonna be too slow I'm going back to the boat Drag a good man away from home Just give me one more kiss, mama Just before I go Look, if I leave here this time You won't be seeing me anymore The moon 
peeps over the mountains I'll be on my way I'm gonna roam this highway Until my dying day What a so long Walking's gonna be too slow mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave here running Walking's gonna be too slow Thanks, guys. Well, to be the oldest son in any family is an enormous responsibility because you've got to be the first one to break the rules. But in a family like David's, no one can envy, in a sense, <laughs> at one level, the life that Roy has led. He's been very conspicuous. He looks like David to some extent. He's got the same smile as you're going to recognize us when he steps up here. But we're looking forward very much to hearing now an opportunity for Roy to tell us about his life with David. Roy Longy. I, I do have to break the news that I got my mum's brains and my dad's looks. <laughs> I see so many friends and new friends now from Pop's beloved Mangry, his South Auckland, and those who have come as far is a spiritual home, the Hokiana, and so terribly touchingly from yet further. And our family thanks you from the bottom of our hearts so you can be with us here today. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister, who I was thrilled to hear to the chosen few in the far north is called Auntie Helen Clark. <laughs> and of course to the great Sir Edmund Hillary, I remember that day when you first came to our house, Sir Edmund. My great contribution to your work in India was that I was ordered very strictly to make the tea. <laughs> and you are remembered with deep love and respect in India. I've seen that with so many people, and it's so good to have you here today. <laughs> our family thanks Mark Goshi who's really made today possible. He's got this characteristic work ethic and above all, a very deep respect for our family. And we also very much thank him from our family. You can take the boy out of Mangri, but you can't take Mangri out of the boy. <laughs> yeah. Mangri is where mum, Byron and Emily and I in the 80s, suddenly saw a great deal of pop on the television. Well, uh, we saw him, but we didn't. The image that we saw was a person who looked well-groomed, statesmanlike, and which was very confusing. So many people laughed at his jokes. <laughs> 282 Massey Road seemed to be the bat cave where he kicked back and relaxed. And when some terrible crisis arose, he would change his clothes and take on a persona that seemed something quite alien to us. With this pop would take a great joy in embarrassing us in recent years. Edith suffered a very similar fate, for bringing friends home from school would be a delicate affair, as he would be without fail in the living room, chain smoking with a huge cup of tea, mug of tea, dressed in the lava lava, and little else. where he would boom a g'day comrade to some friend who looked like a possum in the headlights. 
If we had been naughty, he'd sing to them. <laughs> but his singing was superb, and he would have loved everybody's performances today. I can see him clear as day, tapping him and get, getting into the beat. He loved it. But his singing was superb, and, his, and the, as our neighbours, the Jeremsons, and the congregation at the Mangarees Methodist Church would testify, the family would wake every Sunday morning would testify because we every Sunday morning would wake to the smell of bacon and pop raising the rafters with great bellowed Methodist hymns. I can see him clear as day using the spatula in turn to turn the eggs, then to rather too enthusiastically conduct the hymns broadcast on the national program. And just for the first opportunity to tell us for the upteenth time that as a boy he had sung for the Queen and Uncle Tom's choir. <laughs> Gratefully, when Pop was with us, he was mostly the mangry dad. And really, my brother Byron is the only one of us who directly contributed to Pop's political success. He was playing league for Odehu at a very young age to a capacity crowd at Carlisle Park when the announcer confused his jersey number with a very short, fat Samoan kid. A proud pop always thought that would increase his winning margin by several hundred votes. <laughs> Despite his high profile, as kids caught on very early on in the piece, that pop was not the master of all trades. We could sort of figure out that he must be good at some things because when we walked past a pub, really dangerous looking guys would come out and, and say, thanks Longy for getting me off in 69 for serious assault. So, something along those lines, something terrible. And Pop used to scare the hell out of us because he would remember the exact amount they owed him from years before. And he'd bloody demand it. But there are times when we were left really, truly dazed and confused. Pop took us on the maiden voyage of a newly purchased second-hand plywood boat that even we, who were really very dangerously young, could see was completely unseaworthy. After some death-defying stunts with some very huge waves near the Manukau heads, accompanied with a hearty rendition of Beach Boy songs, we were completely seized with fear. And we started crying for mummy. <laughs> then, with Pop, with a generous amount of speed and style, ploughed the boat square into Mangri Bridge. <laughs> we were inconsolable. But again, Pop always seemed completely on top of things. And with a series of misguided emergency maneuvers, we just made the jetty. And an insight into the humor of South Auckland is that he was very soon after made patron of the Mangry Bridge Boat Club, <laughs> which he enjoyed immensely. Four, four days ago, Arnold Nichols left some amazing old footage of Pop and his brother Peter, our Uncle Peter, canoeing down the Whanganui River in 1962. This trip did not end in disaster, which was rather unusual, but poor Pop was in constant threat of hypothermia because he couldn't get the canoe out of the canoe without having to roll over. <laughs> there, there is hilarious footage of him directing a flock of sheep, which Uncle Peter, rather cheekily, thought that was Pop in training for the Labour Party caucus. <laughs> His strange relationship with transport didn't stop there. Amazingly, at that heart-wrenching moment on Wednesday morning, watching the hearse slowly leave with him to the crematorium, I couldn't help thinking how so very disapproving he would have been of the speed he was being driven. <laughs> Our earliest memories of being driven at breakneck speed to beloved friends and family through the Cultural Loop Road to see the Winyards in the Hokianna, to see his godson Mark who's here with us today, to the Elliots who are here, the McCutcheons who you heard was here, the Pabos and the Carthys, and of course our, his beloved, beloved cousins, the Reeds. When I drive to them now though, I can't remember, I can't actually believe how long it takes. We would always be hijacked by Pops, some cold drafty memorial hall and some bashed up viva, I can still feel the deep pride I felt when Pop would ask me to read his speech to him while he drove on the wrong side of the road. 
<laughs> the only time I know Pop was completely content was while travelling slowly was an Indian rail. He would sit on the filthy stairs to the second class carriage, being rocked like a babe in the cradle, lost to the world. With tears in his eyes, he watched rural India wake to the crimson dawn like he had some 40 years before. That wonderful experience was one of so many that Pop was allowed to have, simply because he was still alive. Pop's whole understanding of preventive health was saving up for the next operation. <laughs> the, 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 saintly doctor, the saintly Dr. Pat Friendly was the conductor of a band of obscenely talented surgeons and the nerfing staff at Middlemore Hospital who have renewed our faith in humanity. These are the people who have gifted us his last 20 years. Pop was also so very, very fond of telling stories and in respect to family tradition, always laughed the loudest. There are some stories, however, that he never told because these are moments that Byron and Sarah, Emily and Alan, Edith, Mito and I will always dearly cherish and will keep so terribly close to our hearts. Though of all the stories I told him, none made me more proud. My mother-in-law attended the wedding of their servant, Nitai, who Pop, against all Indian protocol, had made the servant his dear friend. Nitai is from a village in West Bengal that has no electricity, running water, or roads. She was invited into his small house that is made with mud and has a single room. In that room is the entire Entire, his entire, the entirety of his whole life's possessions. A bashed up tin trunk and a rolled up mattress and something and leaning against that cool bare wall that will now be endowed with yellow marigold. A framed picture of Natai hugging his mate Pop. A favorite story he often told that was told to him by his father Uncle Carl and his son were caught in a terrible flood in the Hauraki Plains. Nature, in all her fury, was throwing everything she had at them. They were literally gasping their last breaths and were so desperately trying to stay together in their last cold moments on earth. Then, as they were being swept into oblivion, resigned to their fate, they miraculously met and climbed up into the safety of this truly great tree. They hugged that tree, so overcome with relief, a deep sense of security, and above all, hope. They hugged that tree for all that it was worth. Uncle Carl's son turned to him and he said, if God is so good, Papa, why did he just try and kill us in a flood? Uncle Carl turned and he said, I don't know, son, but I know why you put this tree here. In a world flooded with the tears of hate and despair, Pop, we know why God put you here. Thank you, Roy. Just to explain what's going to happen in the next five minutes, we're going to show you some film of David, and then we're going to have the national anthem. Lapi Marama is going to lead us in our national anthem. Behind me, we have a prime minister. <laughs> All sorts of people talking about me as being the hope of the Labour Party.
Dear Mr. Lonnie, when you reduce class numbers, could you take these five people out of my class of 25? How <laughs> 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 do you think the future's going to be? Oh, it's going to be good. I'll be a news and current affairs host on television one at 6.30. Prime Minister, can we have a brief word? One minute. <laughs> My friend, I'm sorry to see you go. Can I tell you, Jeffrey? Change my mind. <laughs> concludes our live coverage here at the Big Top. People are still arriving for this celebration, which will continue through the afternoon. But the one thing you could ask for when you go is to go the way you wanted to, and it was David Longy's wishes as to how this event took place today. The Pacific Island community represented, reflecting the music that he loved so much, and as well as the good and the great, the ordinary people from here in Auckland around his electorate, who he especially wanted to be here today. It was our privilege to bring you this coverage. Thanks for joining us. Those were some of the highlights from the public celebration of the life of former Prime Minister David Lange. As the celebration of his life demonstrated, Mr Lange had a very close attachment to the people of the Pacific. In 1989, he travelled to Kiribati. This report was compiled for the Video Dispatch Programme. Kia ora and welcome to the programme. Leaders of many of the South Pacific countries have been attending a special meeting this week. It's called the South Pacific Forum. New Zealand's one of the forum members and our Prime Minister, David Longy, has been representing us there. The forum's been held on Kiribati, which is a small island to the north of New Zealand in the southwestern Pacific. Once a year, the leaders of 15 Pacific Island countries gather to spend a couple of days together. The meeting is called the South Pacific Forum. The 15 countries which make up the forum are all independent nations in the lower part of the Pacific Ocean. Being independent means they control their own affairs, like we do in New Zealand. Because there are so many different Pacific Island countries in the forum, there is always a warm and colourful welcome, like this one held in the Cook Islands in 1985. or this traditional Fijian kava ceremony in 1986. 
This year, it was the Kiribati people who played host to the forum. New Zealand's Prime Minister, David Longy, was greeted in a traditional way when he arrived at Kiribati at the weekend. The forum gives the leaders of the South Pacific countries an opportunity to discuss the problems they share. Like Kiribati, many of the forum countries are small, and by joining together, they have a better chance of solving the problems. The larger, more developed members, like Australia and New Zealand, have a responsibility to help the island states develop their industries. Banana production in Tonga is a project which has been improved with help from New Zealand experts. Transport in the South Pacific is one of the problems the forums already dealt with. A regular shipping service now operates in the area. The Forum Line Shipping Company began over 10 years ago after the Forum agreed there was a need for it. Four ships sail in the South Pacific today, taking supplies up to the islands and bringing produce like bananas for sale in New Zealand and Australia. The Forum has a special method of dealing with problems. It's called the Pacific Way, which means agreement is reached by discussion rather than arguing or fighting. The Forum concentrates on issues that involve the region as a whole, but it's careful to keep its nose out of things that go on inside member countries, like the Fiji coup. In 1987, the Fijian government was taken over by Colonel Rambuka and his army. But although the other forum countries were worried about the situation, they left Fiji to sort it out by itself. In Kiribati this year, the forum discussed many issues, but two of them involved the very survival of island countries like Kiribati. Drift netting by Japanese and Taiwanese fishermen in the South Pacific could, in only three years, destroy the tuna fishing grounds, which are a major source of food and income for people in this part of the world. The forum aims to get rid of the wall of death drift nets from the region, but this will not be easy. They already have an assurance from South Korea that they won't use drift nets in the South Pacific next season but Japan and Taiwan haven't been persuaded to stop using them. This type of fishing not only catches very large numbers of tuna, it also catches everything else that happens to be swimming in the net's path, like dolphins, seals and whales. The forum countries have decided to meet in Wellington to draw up a convention banning drift net fishing, which they hope Japan and Taiwan will eventually agree to. The other big issue at the Kiribati Forum poses an even more serious threat for the low-lying Pacific Islands, the greenhouse effect. Scientists predict that the greenhouse effect, which is causing the Earth's temperatures to rise, melting more ice at the North and South Poles, and therefore causing sea levels to rise, will mean that islands like Kiribati will probably be covered by sea. The forum discussed the possibility of members like New Zealand offering homes to those islanders whose countries would be underwater. Australia announced it will spend $7.5 million over the next five years on equipment to measure any changes in sea levels in the South Pacific region. The forum ended last night determined to put pressure on the industrialised world, which is causing the greenhouse effect, and to have drift netting stopped in the South Pacific. For some contemporary insights into the workings of Parliament, you can view a collection of short videos from the Spotlight on Parliament series. Just head to the New Zealand Parliament website at www.parliament.nz.